this meeting is recorded. Welcome everyone to another online session of Weber Scholars Network. Uh, Weber Scholars Network is uh, brings together not only scholars on Weber, but uh, researchers interested in his work more generally, also on uh, Mariana Weber. And I'm very glad to host another online session, this time on value polytheism and Weber's um, and democracy in Weber's political thought. This is the second session of our new series on Weber as a political theorist. And basically the idea today is to raise the question of what is Weber's role in, in a discussion of democratic theory, considering that he, uh, that, you know, value uh, neutral or value freedom rather is a central aspect of his thought. So, Nowadays, when democratic theory is so centered on norms, on, on, on ethics, what role can Weber possibly have if he refuses to provide a scientific basis or an objective basis to value positions? So what is he good for in a democratic debate in that sense? That's the question that we raise and that our speakers will um, approach today. And uh, they will be Yanis Ktenas, um, who's a postdoc at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens and also in the University of Thessaly. And he is in the field of political theory and epistemology. And we also have Lucia Pinto, who will be joining us from Argentina, who will be introducing herself. Um, and uh, finally, as a discussant, we have Costas Polizos, so also from, from Greece. And Costas is a PhD candidate in sociology of religion at the University of Athens, working on uh, Greek orthodoxy, uh, so the Greek orthodox religion from a Weberian standpoint, and basically on the social, economic, and political effects of Greek orthodoxy in the formation of the modern uh, Greek state and society. So we're very excited to have you all. Uh, of course, it's all of these participants as typical of the network. By the way, if you want to find out more about the network, our website is VeberScholars.net. We have a newsletter where we publish things that are new on Weber and we publicize our events and where you can publicize your own work or interest on Weber as well. And uh, of course, it's a pleasure to have people from all over the world and from different areas, even if we're discussing Weber's political thought, but also, um, as usual for the Weber reception, we have participants who are all outside the Protestant space and even uh, an expert on Greek Orthodoxy. This is typical of the Weber reception and I always find it interesting to know. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'll open the floor to Lucia Pinto who will give the first intervention. She will be followed by Yanis and then Costas will, dis will debate both interventions, and we'll open up for questions from the audience. So, Lucia, the floor is yours. Thanks, Victor, and um, hello, everyone, and thanks for being here. Um, my name is Lucia Pinto. I am a PhD in social science uh, at uh, University of Buenos Aires. I teach a philosophy course in University of Buenos Aires. And my thesis was about uh, the political thought of Max Weber and Walter Benjamin. And I am so happy to be with you all uh, today. I am just came back for, from a research stay, stay in, with Edith Hanke in the Bacharist Academy der Wissenschaften. Um, so now I will share with you some thoughts about politicism and values and democracy in Max Weber political thought. Um, I want to thank Edith Hanke, Victor Staseri, Alvaro Morcillo Lais, and Brenda Weigand for helping in the organization of this session. Thanks also to Yanis Katenas for sharing this session with me and Costas Polisos for being our discussant. I really appreciate this moment uh, with all of you. My presentation is organized in three parts. The first part is about value politeism. The second part is about the relationship between value politeism and democracy. And in the third part, I will share with you three research questions. This is a work in progress, so I will appreciate, appreciate all your comments. Now I will read. Um, 
since the since his earlier methodological writings, Weber postulated the impossibility of a scientific foundation for value systems. In the Objectivity of Knowledge in Social Science and Social Policy, published in 1904 in the Archive for Social Science and Social Policy, he stated for the first time that there is no scientific procedure that can determine whether a value is valid or not. Empirical science cannot answer the question, what should I do? Philosophy, on the other hand, can provide knowledge about the meaning of the values that guide the action of human beings, but it cannot provide knowledge about their validity. This is, in Weber words, just the fate of a cultural epoch that has eaten from the tree of knowledge. In secularized modernity, humans are devoid of the values that once guided their actions, and the science cannot provide them with knowledge of their validity. In fact, science cannot take the place left by religion. Weber argues that values are sacred while recognizing that they are no longer grounded in religion. He says, ideals are just as holy for others as ours are for us. I want to highlight the link that Weber sets between values and dignity, because values are not just one more thing for him. In this text, he writes that, what constitutes, and I, I read, what constitutes the dignity of a personality is that it exposes certain values to which it related its life. A person's dignity lies in having values and eventually in defending them and putting them in practice. In this respect, I follow Carl Lewitt, who links this concept of dignity with freedom postulating that freedom involves the free evaluation of the means to pursue the ends that each person proposes from himself, which at least depends on his ultimate values. In his late writings, Weber emphasized value polytheism as a diagnosis of the modernity, leading to an endless struggle between values. With the birth of his research, values appear, at, appear as codes and conviction as fate. Religion does not have the influence on life that it once did, but human beings continue to believe in gods, now desmythified and despersonalized. Thus, the death of God, as Nietzsche predicted, is translated in Beberian thought into a ring in which multiple gods fight to the death. From the monotheism of a god, we move on to the polytheism of values. In the article between two laws published in February 1916 in the journal Die Frau, Weber writes that we live in a polytheism in which anyone, and I read, can only feel himself subject to the struggle between multiple sets of values, each of which, viewed separately, seems to impose an obligation on him. He must choose which of these gods he will and should serve or when he should serve the one and when the other. Similarly, in 1917, in the lecture Science as Evocation, given in November in Munich, he states that life rests on the eternal struggle between gods, since it is impossible to unify all values in the face of which a decision is needed. Also in the same year, he published the meaning of the value freedom in the soci sociological and economic science in the journal Logos. And he writes that modernity is characterized by an absolute polytheism in which we witness a struggle between irreconcilable values against which only a personal choice is needed. In other words, the irresolvable conflict between ultimate values is a statement that remains unchanged throughout his work. So what is the relationship between values, polytheism, and democracy? As Edith Hanke showed a few weeks ago in the opening session, there is not a handy definition of democracy in Weber's late work. I would like to go back to the fourth thesis of Edith Hanke, which is, for Max Weber, democracy is not a concept of value. As I will show, I totally agree with her. 
in Parliament and Government in Germany under a new political order published in 1918, Weber argues that forms of government are a technical matter that depends on the political ends of each nation. Weber asserts that the historical task of the German nation is above its form of government. He writes, and I read, technical changes in the running of the state do not in themselves make a nation vigorous, nor happy, nor valuable. They can only clear away mechanical obstacles in its paths and are therefore merely means to an end. If in 1918, the most convenient form of government for Germany was parliamentary monarchy, in 1919, once the war is lost and the monarchy is defeat, that will change. In the lecture, Politics as Vocation, given in January in Munich, and in the President of the Reich, published in February in Berliner Borsen Zeitung, he stands for a place visitary leadership democracy. In the President of the Reich, he gives seven arguments in defense of that form of government. All these arguments considered, Weber argues for the strengthening of the President for the sake of national unity as a counterbalance to the fragmentary character of parliamentary representation, and to give him sufficient authority to implement the necessary economic reforms. He understands that the genuine democracy is based on direct election and, in his words, subordination to leaders one has chosen from oneself. So, in 1918 and in 1919, the end is the same, the German nation. But if the context changes, Weber tells us, the means might change with it. In this sense, democracy as a form of government can be understood as understood, sorry, as a technique, not as a value. Now, how should we understand this plebiscitary leadership democracy? Particularly, what is the relationship between the president and the people, the relationship between rulers and ruled in this plebiscitary democracy? Wolfgang Monsen defines Weber option for plebiscitary leadership democracy as the gesture of a desperate liberal, concerning with the preservation of individual creativity and personal values by virtue of which he opts for political leaderships and defines democracy as a mere process of selecting leaders, which separates from the liberal democratic order. From the point of view of Jose Maria Gonzalez Garcia, Weber does not move away, but rather subscribes to the liberal incoherence between the individual as a moral subject and as a political subject. The universal demand that all individuals choose freely, autonomously, and responsibly the ultimate ends of their lives coexists with an elitist political model in which the electorate assumes a passive role of selecting the specificity leader who is the one who effectively decides. I agree with Gonzalez Garcia and consider that these features are present in Weber South, in which politics are made, is made by the leaders. He supports the extension of uh, Weber, supports the extension of suffrage that took place in German after the First World War, and he's very concerned about individual freedom. However, the participation of the masses is not on the podium of his arguments, but rather the strengthening of the leaders. Additionally, it is important to note that although it is true that popular participation is not a concern for Weber, it doesn't mean that the freedom of the politician can be to the detriment of civil liberties. Everyone must choose the ultimate ends of his life and that the government must respect subjective rights. This is so clear in Weber. Against autocratic government in the president of the Reich, Weber says, and I read, let us ensure that the president of the Reich sees the prospect of the gallows as the reward awaiting any attempt to interfere with the laws or to govern autocratically. In this sense, Weber's option for, for presidentialism, different from the parliamentarism proposed one year earlier, is based on the similar argument, the need to strengthen political leadership so they can give meaning to history to give the nation to need to increase politi politicians' machines of freedom. 
White Weber opts here for the, for the plebiscitary leadership and abandons his idea of parliamentarism. Was this the only option? I think the answer is no. David Bitham argues that the choice for the plebiscitary president lies in the need to provide a solution to the problems inherent in capitalist society. Between 1919 and 1919, there were several attempts by the left to seize power. Weber, faced with the possibility that social tension will be reproduced in parliament, opted for a leadership that could ensure the course of capitalism in a Germany deeply burdened after the war. In his argument in 1919, he says that the president must, and I read, lay down the economic order of the future. In a critical time, such as the post-war, it seems that the unity of nation is not only above all the other values, but is the only value. The struggle of values that before should have taken place in the parliament is vanished in a critical time. So now, based on this insight, I have three questions to discuss with you. The first, in Weber's works, the analysis of a form of government doesn't take place out of nowhere, but in historical context marked by a specific debate. The context of 1919 is different from that of 1918, and so are his proposal. In 1918, the parliament must officiate as the place for the selection of political leaders. In 1919, in the absence of the, of the figure of the Kaiser, leaders elected directly by the people are required. In the aim of this event, sorry, if the aim of this event is to think about Max Weber as a political theorist with an, with an interrogation mark, can we think that this gesture of thinking what politics can do in each context is one of the elements of his political theory? In other words, I think Weber asked what politics can do in the face of the circumstances. Making this question and finding thoughtfully answer is just doing political theory. The fact of changing the answer depending on the circumstances is part of his political theory. If we ask this question in our present, what politics can do in the face of the circumstances? I think we would find another answer that Weber did. But his diagnosis of value politicism can be one of the most important elements of his political theory that allow us in the 21st century to think of a concept of democracy that is broader than his concept. Can we conceive a wider concept of democracy that it knows not only the legitimate domination of leaders, but the action of social and political movements which wish to influence leaders' decision-making? Value politicism can also give us some significant elements to think about our contemporary democracies. I think this could imply recognizing Weber's conceptual richness. Values are ends, but no means to anything. There is something very high in values in Weber, in Weber political theory. Number two, my second question. In the choice of forms of government for Germany, parliamentary monarchy and plebiscitary democracy appears as a means to an end, the nation. Can we think that the nation is the fundamental value for Weber? And in this case, what does the nation mean? What other values involves nation? And the third question and the last one, democracy is not a value for Weber, but a technique, a form of government. In our times, can we think the same? Maybe democracy has turned into a value. If we can say that, against which other values is democracy fighting today. In other sense, it is good to think democracy as a singular value, or should we rather think on democracy as the form of government that allows the struggle of values, the values politicism? I think it could be useful to think of democracy as a technique. Democracy cannot be a value, it 
cannot enter the struggle of values because if it lost the struggle, polytheism will be denied. So maybe we can think democracy as the condition of possibility in a Kantian way of the polytheism of values. Democracy as the platform in which polytheism is possible. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Lucia. That was really fascinating and, and enlightening, uh, especially the last the last few questions. This idea of um, Weber's political thought as contextual, as structurally contextual, and that the thing that distinguishes him is um, understanding that the reaction in fa the face of circumstances is the basic characteristic of thinking politically, of acting politically, and relating that to the values. This is also a, let's say, a deeper or a new a new understanding of his concept of realism that would be realism as facing the circumstances that are given but not in necessarily in a, in, a, in a direction a specific direction um, very very interesting but, but I'll, I'll stop here and now we will listen to Yanis's intervention so Yanis the floor is yours Yes, thank you, Victor. Uh, so I have uh, prepared the text. I'm going to read uh, this text and then maybe we could uh, discuss uh, more freely. Uh, I'm really glad to find myself in such a nice company in order to discuss a topic that has been puzzling me for quite a few years now. I fully support Edith's and Victor's idea that we should explore the possibilities of reading Weber as a political thinker, a series of possibilities that have been partly blocked due to the socialization sociologization of Weber operated by Parsons and also due to the widely misunderstood call for Weltfreiheit. I think that the two topics, value polytheism and politics, can be fruitfully connected. So let's get started. Lucia has already provided us with a very solid ground on what Weber meant when he spoke of the polytheism of values so I'm not going to repeat uh, all the things he focused on. I just want to give a short definition of what I perceive value of the polytheism to be. According to Weber, there are various values, that is to say, various guiding principles that orient human action. These principles are not only numerous and different. They also oppose each other, at least potentially, and at least from a certain point on. So uh, Lucia read uh, this very interesting uh, passage from uh, between two laws. I'm not going to repeat it, but I want to um, start from a little earlier than, uh, than she did. Uh, there, Weber says, the old sober empiricist John Stuart Mill once said that simply on the basis of experience, no one would ever arrive at the existence of one God. And it seems to me certainly not a god of goodness, but that polytheism. And then there is a very similar um, passage in a, a other more famous um, essay about uh, the meaning of um, value freedom. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just uh, the, uh, the, the first sentence again. As Old Mill has remarked, any empirical observation of these facts would make one realize that the only metaphysics that fits them is that of absolute polytheism. So, let us open a parenthesis here and note that, in a way, this emphasis on the empirical basis of value polytheism, Weber writes simply on the basis of experience, leaves open the possibility for a different philosophical, let's say, for example, resolution of the value conflict. The philosopher Max Seller at the time tried to provide such a classification of values. In a certain manner, Weber seems not to exclude such a possibility. He just says that we, as social scientists, have to stick to the experience and that such philosophical resolutions of value conflicts, even if possible, don't really matter for us, as there can be no scientific answer to the problem. However, my opinion is that Weber doesn't really believe that these conflicts could actually ever be resolved, even philosophically. Because if he did, large parts of his epistemology would not make a lot of sense. But let me close this parenthesis here and we can discuss this subject later on if we want. In any case, 
the idea of value polytheism means that you cannot satisfy at the same time all the different principles that could guide human action. You just can't optimize at the same time freedom, economic growth, equality, national pride, public health, etc. This means, according to Weber, that you have to either make a sacrifice of one value in favor of another, either to perform a kind of compromise. This idea of sacrifice is fundamental here. If one wants to respect Venus, the goddess of love, they often have to be disrespectful towards Mars, the god of war, and vice versa. To make things even more difficult, science cannot provide us with an easy way out of this predicament. Social science can help us define with clarity what our values are. It can show us what the most efficient means to achieve a given goal is. Are. It can help us predict how things will flow in case we choose one course of action over another. But it cannot take away from our soldiers the burden of having to choose which is going to be the value or the set of values that will orient our actions. At the end of the day, everyone has to choose his or her own God. And this God will necessarily be the devil of someone else. And Weber mocks scientists who, at his time, still thought that would find an answer to this kind of problems within the realm of science. He calls them uh, big children. Okay, so this idea of the impossibility of scientific foundation of values is absolutely crucial for Weber. In fact, Hans Henrik Brun, and uh, I think we have the honor to, to have uh, Mr. Brun uh, here with us today, in his seminal work on science, values, and politics in Max Weber's methodology, notes that, this is a quote, it is surprisingly rare to find general statements in Weber's works asserting that scientific inquiry should be kept free from value elements, that is, expressing in a strict sense the principle of the value freedom of science. On the contrary, the other asymmetrical formulation, which, properly speaking, does not demand the value freedom of scientific inquiry, but the freedom of the value sphere from allegations of scientific demonstrability appears far more frequently. So uh, Hans Henrik Brun says here that uh, even when uh, Weber speaks of Weltfreiheit, value freedom, um, he more often refers to the uh, scientific impossibility of founding a specific set of values. I agree with this interpretation, especially given the fact that Weber attributes to values an absolutely crucial and constitutive role in the selection and the delimitation of the scientific objects, the objects of Grenzung, as he says. Now, moving on towards the political implications of Weber's position, I would like to try to reinforce his position in a way. I'm going to refer briefly to some cases that Weber seems to not take so much into consideration or to not, not put enough emphasis on. This is an effort not to disagree with him, but on the contrary, to solidify his view, taking into account more recent factors and criticisms that have been formulated against his position after his death. First of all, I would say that Weber tends to think, tends to think the problem of value polytheism in terms of different values that antagonize each other. For example, freedom and order, equality and freedom, economic growth, and national, national identity. However, I believe we should also explore cases where there is an unsurmountable polytheism among different interpretations of the same value. For example, no one today is going to declare that they are against freedom. However, there are antinomical interpretations that different political forces put forward in regards to what freedom really is. To give a recent example, during the pandemic, there were people that suggest freedom means not to be vaccinated, as well as others who proposed vaccination as a way of reclaiming freedom. So my point here is that you can have a sort of polytheism, not only among different values, but among different interpretations uh, antagonistic interpretations of the same value. 
Second of all, I would like to try to answer one of the most serious counter arguments that have been formulated against Weber's position. This argument, argument is to be found in the writings of Raymond Boudon, a conservative French sociologist and philosopher who highly appreciated Weber's work. Despite his admiration for Weber, Boudon claims that there are some things that are irreversible in human history. For example, once human rights have emerged historically, you cannot go back. And even in the cases that we can spot a regression, Boudon says, we are in position to judge this as a regression exactly because some universal norms have been established. For example, no one can argue rationally in favor of slavery today. And this is a sign for Boudon that some values can be rationally or even scientifically founded. However, I would say that even if we accept some values as as undisputable, and both Weber, I, and I guess everyone in this Zoom session do accept human rights, even if we think that this acceptance comes through political engagement and cultural formation, not through scientific demonstration, even then, there is a polytheistic aspect regarding the ways in which these values are to be practically applied. So even if we accept there are uh, unconditional values. There is always a value polytheism, a polytheistic aspect uh, in terms of the ways these values are to be uh, practically uh, applied and uh, uh, enforced. What does it mean to respect human rights? Does it mean that we provide to some people the choice of not getting vaccinated? Or does it mean that we get everyone vaccinated in order to protect the most vulnerable, well, vulnerable among us? Does it mean that we support Ukraine in the battlefield or that we adopt a prudent stance, as Jürgen Habermas suggested, in order not to culminate the war? In all of these decisions, there is a moment of pri prioritization of one value over another or an effort of compromise between different values, all of which are crucial for the idea of human dignity. And while I personally have a clear answer on those questions, I do not think that this answer is scientifically demonstrable or the only rational one. The third point I want to make has to do with the possibility of universalization of our values. According, according to this criterion, which of course stems from Immanuel Kant's philosophy and has influenced the work of philosophers such as John Rawls and Jürgen Habermas, we have to commit to principles that can be universalized. Weber does not use this criterion at all. For him, the only possible criteria for value judgments are internal, coherence, and readiness to accept even the extreme consequences of one's value stance. I will come back at this briefly later on. Now, although I do not share Kant's opinion on the existence of a unique human reason, I do believe that the universability of one's position makes them more persuasive and thus stronger and more preferable for those who want to care for other people too. However, I would suggest that even if we discard the obviously non-universable sets of values, such as Nazism or extreme nationalism, even then we are always still left with more than one value choices that demand to be universalized and contra contradict each other, demanding them at least partial sacrifice of the other. This is something Jean-Paul Sartre has already noticed when he said that Kant would not be able to answer to the young soldier that asked him whether he should go to the war against the Nazis and take revenge for his father or whether he should stay home at home and take care of his sick mother. So I believe that these three points in a way amplify Wember's position Making, making it less open to criticism that have been formulated after its original expression. Moreover, exactly because they stress the question of the practical application or implementation of values, they lead us straight to the heart of the general topic of this year's events, the political implications of Weber's work. As we all know, Weber's opposition on the scientific indemonstrability of values have been, has been criticized as relativistic by thinkers of the most various political beliefs, 
not only Leo Strauss, but also Marxists and thinkers belonging to the Frankfurt School criticize Weber's positions as relativistic and irrationalistic, both at a political and at a methodological level. For example, Lukacs, who was friends with Weber, and they both appreciated each other's company, writes that Weber, by not speaking about the totality of the social world, as it is objectively determined by its class structure, is obliged to remain methodologically incapable of understanding history as something different than an occurrence of events. Maybe our friend Victor will have to say some things uh, on this subject. But let me first show why, in my opinion, Weber's approach is not irras irrationalistic. When Weber speaks of the impossibility of a strictly rational or scientific foundation of values, this does not mean he rejects rationality. It just means that there is no universal and unique human reason. And here we have to note that Weber uses the word rationalität and not Vernunft as Kant or Hegel do. On the contrary, there are different forms of rationality which begin for different from different value premises. You cannot, in a solely rational way, persuade someone that their values are wrong as long as they don't contradict themselves and are willing to accept the consequences of their position. A vegetarian and a hunter can eternally disagree without necessarily committing a logical mistake. However, this does not mean that everyone can just say what they want and that there is no ground left for rational argumentation and deliberation. Weber is not a fan of anything goes. On the contrary, he develops a form of strict internal value critique, which aims at discovering inconsistencies in the rationale of the opponent. In an intervention he made following a lecture by Werner, Werner Zombard, Weber mentions, this is a quote, I can tell someone with whom I argue on a specific value judgment. My dear, you are misguided on what you really want. Look, I take your value judgment and I, I analyze it dialectically through means of logic in order to reduce it to its ultimate maxims so that I can show you that there, there lie this and that ultimate possible value judgment, perhaps completely incompatible with each other, or combat compatible only after compromises have been made. Something you had not taken into consideration at all and among which you must choose. This, uh, this is the end of uh, the quote. And finally, let me come to the topic of politics. To begin with, Weber rejected, as you know, the term relativism as he thought that a relativist stance would require the positive proof that all stances share the same value. Quite to the contrary, he called for a lucid position taking. He called for the commitment and the engagement in ethico-political values that give meaning and dignity. Lucia already stressed this fundamental dimension of dignity in the otherwise meaningless life, in this meaningless universe. In a way, we could argue that politics has meaning exactly in so far as there is no scientifically proven answer to the ever occurring problems of our common life. If there was a scientific way to demonstrate once and for all how should we live our lives, what would we be the point of political confrontation, deliberation, debate and struggle? We should just wait for the experts to solve the riddle and then just figure out ways of applying their findings. The dream of a scientific organization of social life, which can be found in early socialists, such as Saint-Simon, but also in some parts of Marxist or Leninist literature, is, according to Weber, unattainable. There can be no replacement of the government of people by the scientifically organized administration of things. However, this means we can interpret value polytheism as the guarantee of the permanence of politics, of the permanence of the irreducibility of debate, disagreement, and conflict over the affairs of the polis. There can be no absolute political science imposing its conclusions upon the life of citizens via the appropriate means in a sort of social mechanics. 
science that we're used to say citing Tolstoy will never be able to respond to the perhaps mo uh, most fundamental question, how should we live our lives? This being the case, a variety of opinions, points of view, approaches, desires, and interests always lie at the heart of the political. In this context, we can also better understand, I believe, Weber's positions on, the uni on university teaching and on the abstention of professors from articulating value judgments in class. This is a subject that is, of course, related, but to my mind, not identical with value polytheism, and it has to be discussed against the background of Weber's critique against the Cathedral Socialisten. I'm not going to do so now. However, let me finish here with an incident from Weber's personal life narrated by Paul Honigstein. So Honigsheim says, Weber is somewhere and he's having an intense conversation and disagreement uh, over political issues with some of his friends and colleagues. Then he observes some of his students entering the space and he suddenly stops speaking. When the company asks him to continue, he refuses, making the argument that his students, due to their relationship, will tend to think that his personal opinions are scientific facts. I think that after what we have said here, we could argue that his reaction was driven not by lack of interest in politics, but exactly by respect towards politics. He wanted his students to be able to develop their own political judgment and not surrender in front of the opinion of an expert. Quite hard to find a more democratic approach in academic life than this, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yanis. Um, also a fantastic talk. I think you introduced uh, different layers for us to face uh, this question of the role of values in, in Weber's thinking about democracy or thinking about democracy or democratic life with Weber. I like very much the idea, one layer would be the antagonistic interpretation of the values, that possibility. Uh, and another, the question of the what, what does it mean to implement these values where you also have, uh, and so I, I see this as, as kind of different layers, and you introduced others. Uh, this is really fascinating, and uh, Yadis mentioned some examples from, from the pandemic, and I highly encourage uh, everyone to read his material, uh, thinking with Weber uh, through the dilemmas, kind of ethical dilemmas that that emerged in the pandemic, and every time that I hear this question, what are the humanities good for? Uh, that's the moment that I th was thinking a lot about how Weber could have helped us uh, to a certain extent to discuss those questions, at least to frame them better, right? Um, of course, uh, if, we, if we're referring to current events, it's for me very hard not to think of what's happening in Israel-Palestine, where, for instance, the value of resistance is being mobilized uh, on both sides, let's say, and I don't think also when we say that they're antagonistic interpretations that we need to necessarily say that they're equivalent. Um, anyhow, but without further ado, though, I will s open the floor now to Costas Polizos, who will comment on the two interventions, and then we'll open up the floor. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, everybody for inviting here to be the discussion and especially thank you to Lucia and Yanis for their very very interesting talks um, they both made some fascinating uh, points uh, uh, but I am going to cherry pick some of them um, um, I believe that a common thread in both their talks and, and that is uh, that is because of the, the Weberian political theory, is this practicality in his politics and his political theory. Um, uh, Lucia uh, posed this, uh, this idea the, 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 that uh, in the center of the political theory, of the Weberian political theory, is uh, the question what can politics do in the face of the circumstances and in the face of the changing circumstances? Um, and especially his idea that uh, democracy is not a value in itself, but a, a technique, a form of uh, government that can be uh, of service to certain 
uh, to this or another value. And and in in Yanis's talk, uh, this this question of the practical application or uh, implementation of values is 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 a really really important question. Uh, and uh, as Victor said, that I think that especially during the pandemic, the Weber could have helped us at least to to frame. Uh, this question, exactly this question, the, the value of freedom. How do 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 we practically uh, implement this value? Uh, for example, um, and there there is um, I happen to read uh, uh, an, uh, a letter that Ernst Trolls sent to Heinrich Ditzel uh, regarding. An economics position at Bonn University uh, in 1917, and he was asked by Hans Ditzel to to make an evaluation of uh, both Max and Alfred Weber uh, for this position, this economics position, uh, and he said, um, I, "I'm quoting here: um, practical politics is his forte, Max Weber uh, forte." Uh, practical politicians do not need final principles, but knowledge of the situation and its possibilities. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that Weber did not have uh, some values. Uh, he was not a technocrat or a bureaucrat. Uh, uh, a, a little bit la later, he says that uh, he is then an overbearing personality who subjugates everything to his political national aims without regard for the people to the left and the right of him and that can can work actually as an answer to um uh, lucia's uh, second question if na nation is the fundamental value for weber um but uh there is an a very interesting sentence that he he writes uh um, i have never understood how this relativism squares with his moral intransigence. Uh, and I think in that sentence, uh, Ernst Trolls um, really sums up quite concisely our whole problem here today. Um, how how can, can somebody be so matter-of-factly, in the case of Weber, but also believe in something, a believe in an ideal or a value, or uh, subscribe to a, a set of ethical uh, guides. Um, I believe that this this um, paradox, uh, in a way, could begin to unfold if we took into account his uh, scientific method, his uh, first thing, um, this interpretative understanding. And especially uh, its rela relationship with uh, uh, the political. Um, uh, Lucia, at the beginning of her talk, talked about that value politicism is taking place in secularized uh, modernity. But then a bit later, she said that uh, values uh, are as gods and conviction is as faith. And that is something that appears to be a contradiction in Weber's thoughts, but I don't think it is a contradiction. Uh, but I believe that Weber sees in the political still some religious elements that have survived. And my hypothesis is that Weber, through this practical, um, uh, this, this uh, view, point of view, this practical point of view that he has of politics, uh, I think that he proposes the, the further rationalization of the political in the context of the secularization and distanciation of the world by removing or at least bringing into surface uh, the remaining religious and theodicial elements from uh, political thought and action. Um, in this project uh, of the rationalization of the political, uh, first thing plays a crucial part. Um, what I find very, very interesting in uh, uh, in Weber uh, uh, is that he, he says again and again that we cannot 
avoid knowing about these conflicts, these conflicts of and struggles of uh, between values. Uh, and why can we not know? Because we have, uh, as Lucia said, eaten from the uh, the fruit from the tree of knowledge, uh, a phrase that he repeats again in his uh, uh, science as evocation lecture. Um, and we, this this awareness of these conflicts is inescapable for Weber because it it is part of this process of intellectualization to which we have been uh, subject uh, of thousands uh, for thousands of years. Um, uh, this intellectualization takes the form of scientific rationalization, as he says. Uh, meaning that, in principle, uh, no mysterious and unpredictable forces play a role in predicting and controlling our environment. Uh, but on the contrary, we can, in principle, dominate everything by means of calculation. Uh, this is the so-called disenchantment of the world, uh, a world which has lost its magic, and in which world there is no end, really, uh, in which we can find the meaning or the answer to something or everything. Uh, but instead, this its place, this final meaning backs out, and its place is occupied by this idea of uh, progress. Uh, and progress is a process that knows really no end. Um, so it seems that uh, this is quite a bleak picture that Weber uh, paints, but um, if science cannot serve as a rational foundation for values, what can it offer? Uh, he, he proposes some things, uh, some services, uh, both in his uh, uh, science as a vocational lecture, but also in uh, his article uh, uh, regarding the meaning of value freedom uh, in science. Uh, I want to highlight uh, um, a service that science provides, uh, according to Weber, and uh, he, I think Weber highlights that too. Uh, this service is clarity. Science, uh, Weber says that science can, science can provide us with clarity. That is the awareness in terms of meaning of where, um, where from a practical, practical standpoint begins, how can it unfold with inner consistency, uh, what are the means and their consequences when it is translated into political action, and so on and so forth. Um, in a word, science, and I'm quoting Weber here, uh, can compel the individual to give an account to himself of the ultimate meaning of his own conduct. Um, why then is clarity uh, so highlighted by Weber? Um, I believe because of this practicality in his mind, this practicality of the political. Um, and because of the secularization of the world we live in the in a value polytheistic world and this value polytheism is taking place um not in the domain uh, of the extraordinary beyond but uh, in the domain of everyday existence uh, from a religious point of view as he says um the interesting thing about uh, and the crucial thing about uh, that move, uh, that move from the beyond to the ordinary everyday, is that is the fact that we enter the the realm of peritechnism uh, of routinization. Here, time plays an important role. Uh, if in the extraordinary of the beyond, time itself is suspended, when one sees. Uh, the end of times in prophetic visions or the stoppage or bypass of time in magical acts, uh, in the routinized everyday, one strives for duration. Uh, to, to, there are no final acts here to serve a God here in this realm, means to serve him in a timely manner, to serve him continuously. To do this, uh, I believe that uh, one really needs uh, first thing, the method of interpretative understanding. Uh, because one must be able to understand the meaning of his action, uh, and this action is taking place in time. Um, and because it is taking, it, it takes place in time. Um, the action in service of a values of a value can uh, 
uh, leads to 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 um, uh, can in in fact lead to some side effects uh, in service of another value of an opposing value. Um, I believe that um, this standpoint uh, that Weber argues for in his science as evocation lecture echoes the characteristics of the ethics of responsibility that Weber argues for in his politic, uh, politics uh, as a uh, vocation lecture two years later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, here, uh, one who subscribes to the ethics of responsibility must answer for the foreseeable consequences of one's action. Um, here too, one must achieve clarity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> um, so this ethics <clears throat> Weber juxtaposes with the ethics of conviction <clears throat> while the ethics of conviction is not irresponsible and the ethics of responsibility it does not lack conviction the crucial difference between the two is that the person subscribing to the ethics of conviction um, and I'm quoting Weber here feels that feels responsible only for ensuring that the flame of pure conviction is never extinguished. Uh, this outlook, uh, while it can be, and it often is, ethically rational, is for Weber politically irrational. Um, and, and here we can see again this, uh, this practicality in Weber's thought um, regarding the, the political. Um, um, the, there can be no, I did what I did, and the rest is in God's hands. Uh, as Weber, I'm paraphrasing Weber here, uh, the political irrationality uh, of the ethics of conviction is uh, located in the fact uh, that it has not dealt rationally with the problem of the relationship between the means and the end. Uh, as Weber says, uh, no ethics in the world can get around the fact that the achievement of good ends is in many cases tied to the necessity of employing morally suspect or at least morally dangerous means, and that one must reckon with the possibility or even likelihood of evil side effects. Um, this is especially amplified in the domain of the political, because here violence uh, is the decisive means. Uh, and when one enters the domain of the political, they must make a pact with the means of violence, and in doing so, they are at the mercy of its specific consequences. There is a great phrase that Weber uh, uses in his uh, Politics as a Vocation lecture. Anyone seeking, quoting Weber here, anyone seeking to save his own soul and the souls of others does not take path, the path of politics in order to reach his goal. For politics has quite different tasks, namely those which can only be achieved by force. Here, I believe this is the secularization of the political that Weber attempts to further. He doesn't have a problem with belief. Belief is at play, he argues, everywhere, both in the beyond in, and in the everyday existence and in the political. Um, what is different is the relationship with time and more specifically, the reintroduction of the problem of duration in the political. Um, uh, so, um, see, so here in the political, uh, it is not enough anymore to hope that one stance against the world will save their soul once and for all, or coerce the spirit to do their bidding. Um, and that is because the emotionalism, as Weber says, of revolution is always uh, followed by a return to traditional everyday existence. Um, uh, and in this everyday existence, the success of the leader is entirely dependent on the functioning of his apparatus. And that apparatus demands a permanent provision of rewards. Uh, politics, after all, means not an explosion or a sudden burst of divine inspiration, uh, but as he says, a slow, strong drilling through hard boards. Um, and uh, I'm wrapping up here. Um, so in this secularized, secularized uh, world and the disenchanted world, um, life is governed by us uh, in the here and now. And that means that is is lived in, uh, in time. 
and the political has to deal with the problem not only between the, the, the problem of the relationship between the means and the ends, but the problem of duration, uh, of time, how to uh, serve a value in the best possible way in time. I, I believe that in this process, uh, Firstin, the method of Firstin can be an invaluable tool. Thank you. Thanks, Costas. Thank, thanks so much for, for these, these commentaries. Um, I like very much the idea of Faber <clears throat> as wanting to push forward the rationalization of the political as actually being in favor of that. And, and then your connection to his, uh, to his epistemology in a way to, the, to how he understands the role of, of social science. Um, and there, the term that comes to mind instead of relativism is maybe perspectivism, that that's the position that uh, best describes, or that that's the adjective that best describes his, his stance. Um, and of course, from your standpoint as a, a sociologist of religion, uh, you, you bring out something that's always present in Weber's thought, no matter what he's discussing which is this, uh, this presence of the divine or, or of, this, uh, of this beyond, of this sphere of the eternal, etc. He, he's, he's always aware that that's somehow in play for, for, for subjects. And then he, even if he will say that this should have no bearing or is losing its bearing on, um, on, a, on a rationalized world. So uh, just very, very interesting stuff. So. Before maybe we go back to Lucia and and Yanis, should we get some questions from the audience as well? Is any does anyone want to just pop in a question here, or should we go back to them and then you do you still need time to think? You can raise your virtual hand if you'd like to ask something. But anyhow, the idea of bringing back the question of uh, of the of Weber's understanding of time, of this duality between the everyday and the eternal, I find very interesting. And uh, Yanis mentioned Lukács. What Lukács would say in that case is that you don't only have this opposition between, let's say, a reified everyday and an eternal beyond uh, that that is necessarily of kind of a religious nature, that you also have a rupture that creates a new, a new time, a new everyday, where things function differently. And it's no coincidence that Lukács' first text as a, as a Marxist is called Tactics and Ethics, and I think he's in direct debate with Weber about all of this, but he will, uh, we will talk about that in another uh, session for sure. So I don't see any virtual hands so far. I really think we should talk about Lucia's second question, which is where is the nation in all of this for Weber? And I may come to that if nobody, nobody asks a question. All right, so I'll just make a point uh, about this issue of the nation, just so that we don't forget that and there are all the other interesting topics that appear. Because uh, despite what Weber writes about the nation or nationality and how that's constituted in, in um, economy and society, at least in the matter that he thinks uh, nation is almost as a presupposition, uh, is like a structuring element of, is, is a given, right? Weber takes nationality as a collective, almost as a given, where individuals are, are inserted. And above all, he sees this becomes a very, a pre very present reality also in his political writings, because he connects nation to culture on one side and to political economy, right? So you have a nation state, which is, uh, which is also a, a political economic entity. And so the threat to the basis of that political economy, whether that's war, that's economic competition, is also a threat to the nation. And culture, of course, bears a role in, in both those aspects. It's connected to nationality in the way that he frames it. Um, Weber sees the different cultures in terms of nationalities, not really as ethnicities, or at, at least he, he has a very ethnic uh, understanding of nation. And that has a direct bearing in political economy, of course, because culture plays a role in, rela in the relationship to labor in, in, economic, in economic life. And the fact that he does this, uh, Weber conceptualizes the nation and culture and embeds uh, the nation in political economy in a time of imperialism, so in, in a time of where you have 
very uh, significant asymmetries between between nation states that are competing, and you have the su the the subjection of certain uh, peoples or nation states to others who are more powerful. All of this somehow bleeds into his conception of nation. I think Weber not only thinks about the nation in a time of nationalism, but also in a time where nationalism and imperialism are are connected. So th those are the things that when when Lucia raises the question of the, nat of the nation comes to mind. Uh, but maybe if I can add another question as well is uh, what happen how does Weber help us when we have to defend democracy? And that's because Lucia raised this question of uh, democ democracy as the condition of possibility of value, uh, polytheism. What happens when a political force uh, goes against that? Because that will also be the criticism to Weber, to, to the possible reaction of Weber to what happens in the Weimar Republic. And I'm, of course, very much thinking of concrete actors today, of right-wing actors that are uh, openly against democracy, but still uh, playing part, playing a, you know, a part of this democratic form as it exists today. There's also the question of what happens when a democracy decides to oppress another democracy or another people, um, which, again, because for Weber, that's such a given, the question that you're organized in an, as a nation state is maybe falls through the cracks. How do we deal with that, right, in the case of war? Um, all right, I threw all of that. I don't see any virtual hands. Let's go back to uh, Lucia and Yanis, maybe for five minutes each to just react to Costas' comments and to these questions. So Lucia, you'd be up now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Costas and Victor, for your comments. Uh, I don't think if I can answer all, but I can keep them uh, for given more thought. Um, but just uh, one, uh, just a couple of things. Um, about the circumstances and the Weber as a political theorist uh, who thinks in politics uh, in his uh, circumstances. Um, I think that um, when I say that uh, Weber uh, asked himself what politics can do uh, in the face of circumstances, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I have to, to give it more thought, but um, all, all the things you say uh, have uh, let me think a lot. Um, I think it's uh, it's something about the context, but uh, getting back to what Victor says uh, about the nation, uh, there is one thing that still uh, in the Max Weber political thought that it's the nation. So what politics can do in the face of circumstance to defend the nation, and perhaps we can think in another uh, value that uh, it's uh, came up uh, today in Janis and Costas. Um, speaking is about the individual freedom. Yes, that how we connect this this nation with the individual freedom that we can we can also think is a permanent uh, value in Weber uh, political thought. Um, so it's a politics in in the context perhaps, um, but uh, it is not a lack of values. I think. Uh, perhaps we, we can we can think Emma, uh, uh, more about that because it's for me it's a it's a big matter and uh, about the nation and the and the rights uh, it seems so um, good to me what Janice uh, says about the that the values can mean different things I think this is this is uh, so so important because. Uh, now in Argentina, we are fighting about the value of freedom, what freedom means, because we are just with a new president, uh, which uh, has won the elections, uh, defending their freedom, and is a president who can also make the universities paid. So uh, how do you think freedom when you are thinking in uh, that university must not be free. Uh, so uh, what, what freedoms uh, means? So here we, we are we are fighting uh, 
we are fighting between different values or we are fighting for the meaning of one value, uh, which is freedom. So so I, I totally agree with you. And I think it's so, so important what, what you say. Um, about getting back from uh, about the from some values, uh, I, I remember uh, Bevert also say that we are we are in an epoch of subjective rights and we can't go back uh, to an epoch without subjective rights. So leaderships can make uh, different things, but uh, we have the, rash the rationalization of the law uh, has bring subjective rights. So now we say human rights, but um, and and I agree with you. In in a case they are uh, denied, we can stand uh, for these rights. But this can cannot avoid that uh, this can be denied. So we can stand up uh, once and more, um, but. Perhaps they are they are in risk. Uh, they, they are continuing risk. Um, about uh, the secularization, uh, the question of costas. Um, yes, we, we live in a secularized modernity, and as Bever when talks about values and compares with cost with gods and the conviction with faith. Uh, so politicians have faith in values. Um, I, the important thing is uh, values here as as gods. They are not gods, but they are as gods. Yes. So we have no longer uh, this religion that uh, builds everyone everything in modernity. Uh, but we we are still not so rationalist at all. So there is a little, a little, little, a little uh, aspect in our reality, uh, luckily, that has not been rationality, rationalized, sorry, uh, that is values. So we can, we can believe, we can think in values, we can have faith in values. And that, I think that uh, doesn't mean that the making values true involves some rationality because you have to think the means to get to these ends. Um, so uh, for me, I, I don't think that values and rationality are uh, such in an opposite way. Yes, because there are some rationality that uh, you need to make uh, the values uh, get um, realized, uh, put in practice. Um, but as, as religion, values for Weber cannot be um, scientific, uh, found, founded by science, sorry. Uh, so th that you have another uh, relationship between values and, uh, and religion. Uh, but I think the topic of secularization, it's a big topic. Uh, and we have to also uh, take in Bl Blumenberg, Lowitz, Weber, St uh, Strauss, Schmidt. So there are a lot of authors that we uh, have to uh, account. And um, about the, the plebiscitary democracy as a technique, um, I, I think that uh, this is the best option in this in this context for Weber. And I um, compare with the parliamentary to say, okay, two years ago, the best option was parliamentary. And now the best option is democracy uh, grounded in the same basic value as a nation. So uh, perhaps we can say value is not, the democracy is not a value because it's not above all, it's not democracy or, or nothing. Is, uh, yes, so this is in the, in the, in a context. Plebiscitary democracy is is an option, uh, and in this way, the form of government are a technique, um, but does not mean that politics are a technique. Nothing more uh, far away from here. Uh, politics is not a, a technique for Weber. Politics is action. Is a struggle. Is the opportunity to give. Uh, the word a uh, meaning and um, needs a technique, need the technique because politics cannot do without bureaucratization. Uh, mass society cannot be governed uh, 
uh, without bureaucratization and science, but uh, it is not not technique. The problem is what politics uh, are are similar, get similar to technique, uh, like Weber says in the in the text of um, parliamentarism. Um, so uh, I have uh, thanks, Victor, for the, your comments about the nation. Uh, they are so important for me and. Uh, the last, what happens when democracy is in risk, I share the worry with you, Victor. Uh, I think that uh, this, these presentations uh, let me think about uh, democracy as a technique, democracy as a value. And I haven't said, but uh, it is so... Um, I have to give them more thought, but perhaps we can say that democracy turns a value when it is in risk, because you have to stand for democracy when just when democracy is in risk. So when everything is okay, democracy can be these rules and uh, procedure that order uh, the, the struggle of uh, values. But when this struggle of values are not possible because democracy is, free, is in risk, you stand for democracy as a value itself. Uh, and uh, I think that that this is uh, it can be one thing uh, for thinking today. So thank you. Thanks, Lucia. Fantastic. So democracy turns into the value that is defended. Very, very interesting. Before I go to Yanis, I just wanted to uh, let the audience know that we, uh, Stephen Turner, who's uh, who's who's uh, here with us today, suggested we take a look at his review of another book that touches on the questions we were discussing today, which is Wendy Brown's Nihilistic Times, Thinking with Max Weber. We will probably make a session on the book, uh, possibly with her. We'll see. Um, but he, in his review, there are elements uh, to, yeah. For our discussion, I'm just going to read a short quote here. Weber responded to the situation of value choice of his own time by demanding intellectual integrity above all. He used the practice of making value choices explicit as a way of clarifying the value commitments of students and others. So the practice of making value choices is part of uh, his understanding of how value, values in political life relate, perhaps. Um, so we'll go to Yanis Hinak. Pouls also has a question. Do you want to just uh, ask the question in a, in a brief manner before we go to Yanis and conclude. Yes, thank you. Okay. First, uh, all these three talks, very interesting. I have a question to Lucia Pinto. Uh, I would stress, as you did, that all what Weber says or writes on democracy is has to be seen in the context, in the political context. And concerning to this, uh, I would uh, like to remember that his expression of plebiscitaire fura democracy, don't plebiscitaire in democracy by leader, uh, this appears once, only once in all his writings. And not in the political writings, but in the theoretical, in the Herrschafts typology. And uh, my question to you, is why do you think there is a shift between Weber 1918 and 1919 concerning democracy and parliament? I think all of what he explains in his great uh, text on parliament uh, in, in Germany and what he's proposing for the new German constitution in 1918 and 1919 is on the same line. And when he is reflecting on the direct election of the president of the Reich, this is a, re is a re reaction by him on the first, on the result of the first elections in 1919. And he is deceived by the non-transformation of the old political parties. And he wants to have a, a shock political shock to transform the parties and this he wants to do by the direct election of the president. I don't see 
I don't see a transformation or a modification of his political thinking on parliamentary democracy. But uh, if you think it, there is a transformation, please tell me. Thank you, Professor Bruns. Um, uh, I have uh, wrote all you have said, and I will think uh, on it. Um, I, I just say that uh, there is a different form of government Bauer is suggesting. Um, perhaps uh, what you say is that the the principles are the principles are the same, and the, there are not such a change between. Uh, parliamentarism and the plebiscitary democracy he's uh, he's suggesting um but uh, the, i think that the the role of the people in the in the second text in the president of the reich uh that has to uh, vote for the president is absent in the in the parliamentary uh, form of government uh, so I, it seems to me that uh, we have to think more about this relationship between leaders and peoples uh, that are, are in the in the pre, uh, president uh, presidentialism form of government. Um, but uh, it's uh, what you say that it just appears once once time uh, is is so important. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lucia. Hinak, we're running a little bit out of time. Uh, so I'll go back to Yanis so that he can have also about five to 10 minutes so that we wrap up. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Victor, dear Costas. I'll try to be brief. But uh, before that, uh, just because uh, um, uh, please allow me some, uh, let's say, self-advertising. Uh, it's not uh, irrelevant, but um, because uh, Victor uh, talked about the pandemic and uh, he had visited me in Vienna when I was writing this book on Weber and the pandemic. And uh, this book came out in... Uh, uh, no. mm -hmm. There is a problem with uh, the background. Okay, it came out in Greek, but you can read uh, some things uh, about it in English in uh, the link I'm sending. And also uh, in the blog of uh, Weber Scholars Network, I had... Um, published a short outline of my review. And so it's a value polytheism during the pandemic, right? I'm sending the, the link uh, just now. Uh, so um, I, 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 I will try to make three points, actually, right? Um, the one has to do with what uh, uh, Victor said about the different uh, layers of uh, value polytheism, or the different strata, let's say, of uh, uh, value polytheism. Uh, I think that's true, and I think that's true uh, already in Weber's writings. It's not um, something I, I only bring up, okay, I, I provide a different dimension, but uh, this is something that is there already in Weber writings. For example, uh, you could say there are um, va polytheistic aspects, meaning there can be no a ultimate rational foundation of one answer or another in different layers in Weber's work, right? For example, uh, when you have to choose between politics of conviction and politics of uh, responsibility, as Costa said, of course Weber seems to be more in favor of uh, the politics of responsibility, but he has some respect for politics of conviction. Uh, given certain uh, conditions, right? For example, um, when he visits uh, the anarchist communities in uh, this um, mountain, in uh, uh, you know the, uh, the, uh, the 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 mountain in which the book uh, Weber and the Culture of Anarchy refers to, right? It's uh, Ascona, uh, yeah. Ascona, right? In uh, Switzerland, right? yeah. He sees people living by the uh, ethics of um, of uh, conviction, and he has a deep uh, respect for them. Uh, another layer uh, could be, for example, uh, when you have to choose a, um, between uh, political engagement and personal or family life, for example, or when you have to choose 
between truth and other values. That's something very interesting because uh, Weber says that uh, I personally, with my work, I choose uh, the value of truth. But uh, there are people that would choose other values over truth, and this is this is not a rational, uh, you know, a, a completely rational procedure. And then there is a value polytheism inside each of these strata, right? Okay, so uh, this, as far as it uh, uh, concerns the different strata, of, uh, for example, if you choose the political life, then there is a, a battle of gods inside the political uh, layer. Okay, so second of all, coming to uh, Weber and de democracy in a way. I was very interested uh, in what uh, both Lucia and Costas mentioned, that for Weber, democracy is a, a sort of um, a apparatus or a, a form of technique and not a value per se, but it can be uh, also, it can become a value. And I would say that's true, but also I would like to know that um, some aspects that perhaps are not uh, democratic per se, but are fundamental for us today as part of uh, democracy, for example, human rights, are also fundamental um, for, for Weber, right? And uh, I like what uh, 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 the translators of the classic edition of uh, Weber political writings uh, write in their preface that um, Weber is a, a liberal without natural law, right? Uh, with that. So he commits to these uh, values, but he doesn't believe that they are founded in uh, the nature of uh, man or whatever. But uh, this certain distance he has from democracy, uh, uh, we could at least say that democracy is not an absolute value for Weber, right? Sometimes we can go along with it, sometimes not. But this distance he has from democracy also allows him to uh, see things more with more clarity, more uh, clearly, right? Because it's not something that you can uh, never challenge. So uh, he has this uh, critical distance that allows him to make some really deep observations. And this um, uh, brings me to, you know, uh, a, a, a subject Costas raised, if I understood correctly, whether, um, how can it be, how, how can it be that uh, Weber is, let's say, perspectivist or uh, relativist, but still commits to values uh, in a, such a, um, an intense way? And I would say that... Uh, Hulls, uh, sorry, Yanis, that was Ernst Trolls that said Yeah, yeah, that. his friend's uh, notes, right? So he knew something, he knew something. So um, I would say that um, when you say, when you, uh, philosophically, you believe there is no absolute value. The one choice is that you go um, uh, nihilistic and uh, become, you know, and begin to say nothing makes sense. The other option, perhaps, the one Weber takes, is the one of integrity. So uh, Victor uh, read this part of um, Stephen Turner's uh, uh, review, and there there was this um, uh, term of integ integrity, something very important for Weber, this intellectual and political also integrity, right? Um, so the interpretation would be this. Exactly because there is no absolute value, we have to, in a way, be honest and respect uh, other people's values. And we cannot just sacrifice everything uh, in favor of this non-existent uh, ultimate value, right? And then uh, a third uh, a third point, uh, and uh, as, as, before me moving on to the third point, I think this is something also very touching in Weber's personal life, right? The way he um, defends uh, students of his uh, that uh, with whom he disagrees politically, or the way he defends uh, uh, his Jewish friend, uh, M M Robert Michels, right? Uh, that couldn't find a job in a university because uh, he was um, Jewish, etc. And the third, uh, the third uh, point I would like to make uh, it has to do, but only partial. I mean, it's a, 
uh, not a direct answer to the question of uh, Weber and Nation, but you know, uh, uh, a comment from the side, let's say. Um, in the this book, in this book uh, uh, for, for the pandemic, I also tried to think um, uh, about um, a point I m made in my speech today. Uh, this um, um, relation uh, of values with the possibility of universalization, right? And I'm not taking Kant's road. I do not believe that there is a unique uh, human reason, but uh, the values that can be universalized uh, are uh, more persuasive and thus stronger. And then I also make the claim that history, sometimes history can be uh, used as a, a criterion for universalization, not in a Hegelian way, not in a Marxist way, but um, uh, yes, thank you very much. It was perhaps similar, not Michels. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Daniel. But uh, yes, so history can be a criterion for universalization in which way? It can help us see what values cannot be universalized. So uh, in the early uh, 20th century or uh, even more in the early 19th century, nationalism had a, a liberating uh, potential, right? Now we do know that uh, that's not true and that you cannot universalize uh, national values without uh, bringing the whole humanity uh, at risk. Uh, so that's um, another idea I'm working on, how you can uh, have some criteria of un universalization. But the thing is that uh, what I also tried to point out, there will always be more than one universalizable uh, values, right? So even if you, you, you use the universalization criterion, um, you still end up with uh, polytheism. So this would be, yes, my comment on that. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Yanis. That's a fantastic finish. Um, so I'll wrap up today. I wanted to thank again uh, our speakers, first of all, Lucia Pinto and Yanis Ktenas, and our discussant Costas Polizos. Again, you can go to weberscars.net if you want more info on the network. Just one last word. We came back all the, uh, often to the question of rationality in Weber and the fact that there's not a unique concept of rationality uh, and how this is also a bearing on this discussion on values and on him as a political thinker. So maybe this is something we should, we should make a topic of another session. And, I, and then I want to refer to the book from Patricia Lambruschini, uh, also an Argentinian Weber scholar, which is called Las Antinomias Entre lo Racional y Irracional, so the antinomies of the rational and irrational, where she really goes into all the different concepts of rationality and irrationality in Weber and how plural they are and how complex that is and hard to pinpoint, actually. A book that uh, we should try and circulate in English. As I would say, Yanis, your book on the pandemic, it would be great if uh, we had that available in, in other languages. If you want to translate it to Portuguese somehow, let's uh, dis discuss that. Um, and just, okay, so final announcement, our next session will be on January 18th on uh, Weber and uh, democracy and the rule of law in Weber and Kelsen. And that will feature Stephen Turner. So a very special uh, session indeed when we go come back after the, the pause in the, at the end of the year. So once again, thanks so much. Uh, write us if you want to know more about the network at info at Weberscars.net. And have a great end of the year, everybody. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Do you want to uh, say something, Anna?